All right. So hello. Um, I do apologize for the last minute rescheduling of this session. I think that probably did affect people's ability to attend, but I'm so glad a few of you were able to be here with me today. And we are recording now for the benefit of those who could not attend in person. Um, I am Erin Owens. I'm a professor in the Newton Gresham Library here at SAM. Um, today's session is number two in a series of three about how to publish uh, aimed at graduate students and other early career researchers. And today we're going to focus in particular on preparing a paper for success. So sort of what comes between writing some content and uh, getting it published. Um, my frame of reference today is coming not only from my experience as an academic author myself, but also in my experience as an editor for a scholarly journal in my field. So I'm trying to kind of bring both of those hats to the front to think about my author experience and my editor experience and um, hopefully give you some useful advice. Excellent. So some of my goals today, um, I want us to think a little bit about recognizing the differences between the scholarly writing that we do in journal articles versus the type of writing that we would do in a class paper or a thesis or dissertation. Okay. Uh, we will identify some strategies to ensure that a manuscript is as ready as possible to be submitted. And then we'll discuss a little bit how to navigate the publishing process after submission, including going through the peer review process, revisions, and then coping or dealing with uh, either acceptance or rejection. So thinking about student versus scholarly writing, I'd like you to take a minute to just think about um, your dissertation, your thesis. If you haven't gotten to that point yet, just think about another paper that you've written for a class at some point. Um, what aspects of that paper do you imagine you might need to change in order to convert it from a class paper to a scholarly journal article? I'm curious to see your uh, thoughts. You're welcome to type them in the chat, or since there's only a few of us, you're also welcome to just unmute yourself and uh, share out loud. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm originally from uh, Palestine, so I was um, a new student in Sam Houston University studying a master's in public health. And I start writing and I'm doing good. So I'm just like, I don't know what can be published and what is like normal for a classroom. So okay. I we did uh, reflective essays, we did uh, analytical biographies and like, I don't know, I get full, full marks for them, which is good, <laughs> but I don't know if it's, publish material or not, I don't know. Okay. So, because I'm new in the field, so. Sure. <laughs> um, I mean, this is a great question. Uh, for me, I've read a lot of journal articles. I've taught journal articles uh, to my freshmen. Um, I, this is one big question for me is, I, I don't know that, I mean, I don't know if what I'm writing is too simplistic or if it doesn't have, um, you know, something unique or um, strategic that is adding to the field. Um, and my writing is solid, my writing is solid, you know, grammar and, you know, those kinds of things. But in terms of content, I feel like what I read is so much more lofty or difficult or, and I, I know that's not just the way to determine on the contrary, because there's a lot of journal articles that are easy to, easy to read and understand and they're great and helpful. Um, one thing I've thought of is if I am a teacher, so th that's a strength for me. So if I were to teach in my writing, not, in a condescending way, but kind of like have, like think of it like whatever I'm learning, I'm then communicating, that might be helpful. So I um, like this, this, other, this other gal, um, Mary, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what would be, you know, true content that would be strong enough for, for articles. Sure, okay. Long answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, I just finished writing one of my capstone drafts. So um, I think the biggest thing would be length, cutting down that length to make it that. Um, 
like rearranging the figures and tables to make it shorter and acceptable for the paper. Um, I would definitely have to cut down some of the introduction. Part of it at that point is where you're going, okay, these people are reading my article because they have an interest in this field and they know a little bit about it. So I don't have to explain as much in the introduction. Um, yeah. But then it's also making everything just more succinct in the results and discussion as well. So. Sure. And so that's, that is an excellent segue to my next slide. So um, I borrowed an infographic that is directly speaking to theses and dissertations, but I think most of their points are pretty comparable for anything that we might write in the classroom. And this sort of summarizes um, the key things we need to think about modifying to turn these into journal article style writing. And length is definitely a big one. Um, maybe not just an average class paper, but certainly like a dissertation that's written to be very lengthy and thorough and comprehensive. We're really gonna wanna think about paring that down. Um, and that may mean multiple articles, or it may mean simply focusing on one facet of it and, and increasing that concision. Um, but the purpose I think is really the big one too, that when we're writing any kind of a paper in an educational classroom setting, we are trying to demonstrate the knowledge that we've gained and applied. Um, and demonstrate that to our instructor and our, and our classmates. Um, once we move into the journal article world, we're wanting to add a little something new and we don't necessarily have to do as much to justify background knowledge that we hold. So we wanna make certain assumptions about the foundational knowledge that other members of our discipline would hold coming into that journal and make sure that we're only explaining the pieces that need to be explained in the context of our study and not trying to give them the entire history of the topic that led up to our paper. Um, in addition to just overall length of the paper, length of the literature review and the references in particular um, comes into play. You really don't need to be as exhaustive. You wanna make sure you're very much focused just on the uh, pre-existing work that directly relates to the study you're doing and just citing things that are necessary to set the context, um, show the existing state of research, the gaps and where your study fits in that. Um, and then similarly with materials and methods, you may not need to go into as much detail on a particular protocol if it's something that you think would already be understood by people in your field. Um, you may not need to define some of the underlying you know, theories and frameworks and things that you're working off of. So, um, so hopefully that kind of gives you a sense of how some of these major factors will compare to, to make sure that we don't just take a paper coming out of a class and send it off right as it is, because it's probably not quite where it needs to be. Even if the content is solid, even if you've made excellent research, you want to make sure that the structure also fits what's going to be expected. Um, thinking about following instructions <laughs> and this may sound sort of obvious, but many times, let's say the field you're working in um, normally cites everything in MLA. And MLA is what you're comfortable with. It's how you've prepared your paper. But now you've picked a journal, you've looked at their website, and their website says, well, we want you to use Chicago instead of MLA. That kind of can throw us into, uh, throw us a little bit outside of our comfort zone to go through and make those types of changes. But we really don't want to just tell ourselves, oh, it's fine. They'll read it anyway. If they like the paper, then I can change it. Um, you really want to make sure that you're following all of their submission instructions up front the way they ask for it. In many cases, even if it's an excellent paper, if something comes to my desk as an editor and it simply doesn't follow our format, it doesn't follow the instructions that we've set forth, I may just bounce it directly back to the author before I ever send it out for peer review and just decline it and say, hey, thanks for submitting, but this doesn't look the way we want it to look yet. Go ahead and fix it and then we'll read it. Um, so we really wanna think about that upfront to make sure that we're saving time and energy for ourselves and the editors. Um, examples of things you may find, the way that a certain journal wants section headings in the paper. They may want you know, very specific words put on sections like introduction or background, um, or they may want those formatted in a particular style. They may want some kind of a header or footer, like a running header with the title of the paper and page numbers, or they may not want you to use headers and footers. 
um, footnotes and endnotes. Some journals will mandate that all of your references be in footnotes or endnotes, even if your style, your uh, citation style normally doesn't use footnotes. They may ask for it. Um, or they may tell you, you cannot have footnotes for any reason. Um, whatever citation manual they're asking you to use, they may just say, follow this manual to the letter, or they may customize it some way that's peculiar to their own context. So we want you to mostly follow APA, but then make this one quirky change to all your citations. And that can get really frustrating sometimes as an author, but if, if they've laid the instructions out, we just wanna be sure we're following them. Um, we wanna be sure we're using the edition of the style manual they ask for. So that uh, MLA or Chicago may have just come out with a brand new edition of their guide. The journal copy editors may not have adopted that new edition yet. They may not be prepared to account for the changes in the way that things are formatted. So if they're giving you an older edition number, make sure you're following the rules in that edition. Um, there will be differences between whether they want your citations to have digital object identifiers, DOIs that uniquely identify the article or uh, URLs, oops, URLs that point to its location or both. So just paying attention to what kind of identifier they want in the citation. And as always, be cautious of computer generated citations. Um, if you're using some kind of a tool that formats those into a certain style for you, just being sure that we're looking at them and making sure that that tool is giving us accurate results. Um, even something as simple as an abstract, each journal is, may have its own rules about how long they want that abstract to be, no more than X number of words. And some journals may ask for what they call a structured abstract. So the abstract itself will look like a miniature outline of the paper and will say, you know, purpose, methods, findings, conclusions, um, and have one or two sentences that just sum up each of those areas. So if they ask for that, you want to be sure you go ahead and break your abstract out like that. And then any little other funny extras that are there that are unique to that journal. Um, I sent in a submission recently for a journal in my field that wanted implications for practice pulled out at the beginning of the article and they wanted three to five bullets with really the key takeaways that a practitioner could read um, that would give them instant, you know, this is what I can do with this, how I can apply this. And that was something I hadn't run across before. So it really made me stop and do something different in that manuscript. And that's why we wanna read all of their instructions very carefully. Proofreading. I cannot tell you how essential proofreading is. And it can be really difficult with your own writing. If you've been grappling with a paper for a while, you may have read your own sentence so many times that your eyes can't see a particular mistake anymore. It's just become too familiar. You know what it's supposed to say and you're seeing it the way you the way you expect it to be. So I've tried to share some tips here that can help in proofreading your own work. Um, as simple as it sounds, using like a ruler or another piece of paper and block off everything but that one line you're reading and just focus on one line at a time. And it helps to it helps you to take a step back from the context of what you know the paper should say and focus on the literal black and white words on the page. Look for errors that you often make in the past. If you know that commas are not your thing, then know going in that you want to focus on commas and focus on just one type of error each time. So maybe you say, this draft I am reading through and I am only looking for commas. The next time I read through, I'm going to look at verbs and make sure all my verb forms are correct or my subject and verbs agree in number, that kind of thing. Definitely take breaks. And again, that's that's the fact that we become too accustomed to what we know we were trying to say. So make sure that we take some time to step back, sleep overnight, go work on another project for a while, whatever it is, and then come back so that our brain is a little bit more cleared from the previous read through. Um, reading it backwards. I know that can sound weird. Reading it backwards can really help. You just start with the last sentence, go one sentence at a time. It's another way to break you out of your expectation of what you uh, what you intended the writing to say. Reading it out loud is one of my favorites, not just for catching mistakes, because sometimes it's not really a mistake. It's just something that when I read it out loud, I realize it's clumsy. Um, it maybe doesn't flow very smoothly. Maybe once I'm reading it out loud, I realize, this sentence is really long. I'm having to 
stop and take a breath. And I want to stop and think about how I could break that up for my reader. So it'll help you catch mistakes that sound weird, but also just awkward aspects of the writing. And then asking a colleague to read it, um, whether that's a, you know, an advisor, a mentor, a classmate, a peer, um, you know, just someone who's willing to give it a read um, and comment on either big things in the content that aren't making sense to them that they don't think have been explained and connected thoroughly or else just little things saying hey you seem to have some issues with commas why don't you go back and look at that um, that can be really really helpful to to get a second person's opinion and then thinking about anonymizing our submission before we send it in so you've probably heard of blind peer review or double blind peer review um, most academic journals will use some form of system where the either the um, reviewer's identity is unknown to the author or in many cases where both identities are unknown so i don't know who the author is the author doesn't know who the reviewer is um, and it can help to help to minimize any bias that might come from knowing the person's identity but sometimes we can undermine that anonymity unknowingly when we submit our files so we want to think about um have I referenced my own name somewhere in the paper or my title that I need to take out? Have I made references to my institution? Because if I've named my university and I'm talking about some specific area of work that might make it obvious to trace back to me, don't forget URLs. Maybe I didn't explicitly type Sam Houston State University in there, but if I link to something that's available on our website that factored into my research, that URL itself may give away my institutional affiliation. So thinking about which things we need to temporarily remove for that peer review process. Um, any identifiable citations, uh, whether this is you or a co-author, if you've written something before that you are citing in your new paper, um, you wanna take a moment and stop and say, okay, is this the kind of citation that's just going to blend in among all my other literature? It's not going to be obvious that it's the same author. Or if I'm saying, well, this study builds on that study, then it's going to be obvious it's the same author. So you may want to remove that, redact that entire citation temporarily uh, to, to maintain your anonymity. And then file properties are really the insidious one, I think, that can slip by us. Um, when we create and save documents in Microsoft Word, it will often save metadata in the background that indicates who created the file, um, maybe what institution the file was created at, that kind of thing. So we may not realize that everything we can see in the text <coughs> has been redacted, but our name is actually hidden in the background on that file. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, editors will be checking for this. Um, if we're doing our due diligence, we should be looking and making sure that metadata has been removed. But it's also a great idea for you to learn how to check that on your own. Um, I'll be sharing the slides afterwards and I've got a link here to step-by-step -step instructions that go through various Microsoft Office programs like Word and Excel, um, as well as Adobe PDF. Um, one note I wanted to make here, just sort of on the subject of bias, I think, we talk about blind peer review as being intended to minimize bias, but I do think it's important to take a moment to acknowledge that other types of bias may still remain in the review process. Um, even without your name or your institution, a reviewer might make assumptions about the country or the state or the region that your research pertains to, um, your topic or your methodology or even a dialect that they think is emerging from your writing. That may cause them to make assumptions about your identity, and that may shape how they review the paper. Um, just as some made up examples, they may see qualitative research about children's feelings, and the reviewer may say, well, that sounds like research that a woman would do, and maybe subconsciously, I don't think that women in my field are as knowledgeable as male researchers. So maybe that comes through in my review that I may be paternalistic and patronizing um, towards that author simply because of my own assumptions about their work and what I think it says about their identity. Um, similarly, if English is your second language as an author, that may be reflected in some of your vocabulary and syntax mm -hmm. choices that just comes through with a different feel to the, to the language. And whether it's conscious or subconscious, 
the reviewer may um, view the paper differently because the um, content sounds differently than they expect it to sound, even if the ideas are, are solid. So I just sort of like to acknowledge that, that it's great to remove our identities, but we should be realistic about knowing that there can still be some opportunities for bias. And if an author feels like a reviewer's comments are not fair, if we feel like they've said something that is predicated on some kind of real or assumed um, bias, that should be something that we bring up to an editor to, to deal with. Okay, navigating peer review. I absolutely loved this picture of the little girl riding the snail. This just this just summed it up for me. Um, patience is really the watchword when we're going through peer review. The process takes time. Um, we want to remember that most of the time, the editors and the reviewers are all faculty and researchers themselves. So they have their own busy schedules to juggle in addition to doing this work with the journal. The editor needs time to review your submission just to make sure it's generally appropriate to the scope and purpose of the journal. Then they need to select reviewers who are knowledgeable enough on the topic, send invitations. The reviewers need time to actually receive and consider those invitations, accept them. Um, and then they need time to read the paper and draft what we hope will be constructive feedback. Um, if a particular reviewer declines that invitation or if someone has accepted, but then they're late in submitting their review, that just adds time to it that the editor has to continue to deal with those reviews. Um, once all the reviews have come in successfully, then the editor has to read them all, evaluate them, um, decide how they wanna compile all of that feedback and make a decision and draft that decision letter to share the feedback with the author and let them know what will happen next. Sometimes we may get reviews that are contradictory um, reviewer A says, this is a fabulous paper, publish it just as it is. And reviewer B says, this is trash and will never be publishable. And that can really put an editor in an odd spot to say, well, why, why on earth are these opinions so opposite? Yes. In which case we may want to go get a third opinion to help us mediate that contradiction. And again, it just makes the whole thing take longer. So we just want to be patient and compassionate for the labor that our peers are providing through this process. <laughs> responding to reviewers. So our paper's gone through peer review. We've finally gotten back a letter from the editor that uh, compiles together all the feedback they received and tells us what we need to do with our paper. Sometimes you will get just a straight rejection. We've, we've just decided we don't want this paper at all. Sometimes you may get a straight acceptance. We want to publish it right now. That's not super common. Um, it is extremely common to get a request for revisions. Um, very normal to go through at least one round of revisions, sometimes several rounds. So I like to remind people up front that that does not reflect poorly on your research or your writing. It's, it's just a common part of the process that yes. the goal is to shape your article into the best version of itself that it can be. And that will often involve some revision and polishing. Now, when you receive the reviewer and editor comments, some of their suggestions are gonna sound really reasonable. Some of them you'll read them and you'll say, yeah, you know, that would make my paper better. I'm happy to make that change. Um, sometimes two reviewers may give you contradictory or opposite suggestions and you have to decide how to reconcile them. Which one do you agree with more for the, for the context of your paper? And then sometimes you'll get suggestions that simply reflect things that you can't or won't change for mm -hmm. any variety of reasons, and that's okay. You as an author are not obligated to make every single change that a reviewer suggests. Okay. What you want to do is to communicate to the reviewers and to the editor which changes you have made and which you have not and why, as long as you have a good reason for why you don't feel like you can make that change to your paper, then it's usually going to be okay. So you're, um, You'll usually be asked to draft a response to the reviewers about the changes you've made. This could just take the form of, of a letter, kind of a narrative. Um, I usually do mine like a table with side-by-side -side pieces that have the suggestion and my, uh, my response to it. And so you'll want to address any major comments, explain either what change you made or why you didn't make a change. Um, 
you don't need to kowtow to the reviewers. They're your peers. They're not necessarily your superiors. They, not everything that they say is somehow more superior to, to your opinions. Um, so just make sure that your response is respectful, just showing basic courtesy for their time and energy in sharing those opinions. Um, you don't necessarily have to respond to every little tiny comment either. Um, they may provide comments about a word choice here or there that they think would sound better. You don't necessarily have to include all of those in your response. You can simply make the change or not um, and just make sure that you're addressing the really big issues. Um, at the end of this slides, I'm gonna have a slide with some selected resources that I've linked to. And I've linked to, whoops, I've linked to a couple of sources in there that give templates for responding to reviewers and different types of advice for how to phrase that. So some of those may be helpful to reference if you get to that, uh, to that stage. I wanted to share one brief note here thinking about co-authors. Um, are most of you writing solo or writing with collaborators thinking about possibly co-authoring? Solo. It'll be with a co-author. Okay, um, excellent. And I know it varies a lot just by discipline and by the topic you're working on um, as to which is more typical. Um, we will all probably have points in our career where we do a little of both solo and collaborative authoring. Um, so just thinking about a scenario, if we do have a co-author, when we reach this stage of the publishing process, it's really critical to make sure that all of the co-authors have a say in making the revisions and addressing the reviewer comments. Mm. Um, it can cause some really bad blood if one person makes a whole bunch of changes and just sends it back and never asks their partner's opinion or and they never come to an agreement about it. Um, because some of those changes may be things that the other person wasn't willing to compromise on. So I think it's very critical that everyone communicate and be involved in that process. Um, you also want to be sure that all the co-authors are on the same page about who has contributed what to the process of creating this paper and how those contributions are going to be attributed. Um, in a lot of disciplines, there's conventions for the order that names are put in the byline. Some disciplines, the first author is the most significant, but in other disciplines, the last author is the most significant. Um, some put them in order of the significance of contributions, some put them in alphabetical order. The conventions can really vary uh, among disciplines, among institutions, among journals. So one of the standards that's starting to emerge is including an explicit statement in the paper that details the author contributions. Um, and I, I'll have a link in the slides to a particular standard for this called the credit taxonomy. And it defines specific roles that an author may play and um, defines a format for how to include a statement in your paper where you say, author A did X, Y, Z, author B did A, B, C. Um, and then there's no question marks about what does it mean that your names are in this order in the byline? And uh, there's no questions about who contributed to what aspect of it. And I think working all of that out in advance among yourselves can really help to avoid any disagreement and bad feelings later on if there's um, questions about who had responsibility for the work. So what happens next? And I don't know if any of you ever watched South Park, but my text on this slide is definitely a reference to the underpants gnomes in South Park. <laughs> they, they would always say, step one, steal underpants. Step two, mm -hmm. step three, profit. <laughs> and it has always made me laugh because I feel that in academia sometimes with that step two of, I have no idea what comes in the middle. <laughs> so when we think about what happens next in this <clears throat> process, um, your revised manuscript may go through another round of peer review after you've revised it and resubmitted it. Um, that may help happen multiple times. Eventually it may go through just a final review by the editor to make sure you've addressed all the main points. Um, essentially a paper could go through an infinite number of peer review rounds as long as both the editor and the author continue to feel like they're making progress and the end result is worthwhile. Um, at some point though, oops, at some point, 
you as an author are not obligated to keep going through that process. So if a journal has continued to put you through more and more rounds of review for two years and you're sort of getting sick of it, you have a right to just end that process and remove your paper and go send it somewhere else. So don't ever think that you're beholden to that journal. Um, if your paper is eventually accepted, yay, no further revisions required. Then it goes into copy editing, gets all the nice little details, spelling and commas, all that stuff worked out. Um, sometimes they'll send the copy edited version back to you for a final glance, sometimes not. Then it goes into layout and they actually take your Word document and make it look like their journal pages. Um, sometimes they'll send that back to you, the file called proofs, and ask you to review those to make sure, final check, everything looks right on the page. And then the article goes into production where it gets placed in the issue, um, often digitally since many journals aren't publishing in print anymore, um, but they still call it going to print. Some of the language just sticks with us. Going to print. Um, and then some journals will post the article on their websites before it actually goes to print. There will usually be some kind of a tag on it that says it's uh, in print or online before print. Um, and it won't have a volume and issue and page numbers assigned to it yet. So that's how you kind of know that it's a little bit like the like the sneak peek advance release. And then it eventually finally appears in print, whether that's a paper journal or just the official digital issue with its uh, volume issue and page numbers. And now the publishing process is really over. Okay. But what if the process goes the other way? So I wanna talk a little bit about coping with rejection. And this is another place where I'd kind of like to hear from your experiences uh, this far. If you faced any kind of rejection professionally, um, a job application, a dissertation proposal, a grant application, conference proposal, any sorts of things that you may have submitted that weren't accepted, um, what, what helps you to cope with that feeling of rejection? This is another moment you can type in the chat or you're welcome to just unmute and talk either way. I think for me, I think for me, um, just the practical kind of mental, mentally telling myself, this is not that unusual, like a submission that was submitted once with some suggestions to change it. Uh, that's normal. That isn't necessarily, especially as I've not really kind of been out into the workforce, you know, uh, so uh, I think that that helps a lot because I do know, you know, you hear all kinds of stories of authors who have submitted their manuscripts, you know, 50 times and finally it's accepted and then they're famous. You know, I, I don't want to be famous, but just the idea of being accepted, I wouldn't mind being accepted. So um, I've only submitted twice, so I don't have a huge amount of experience with submissions, but I think just telling myself this isn't that unusual. And I, I actually have not consciously gone back to those are those papers to modify only because I got involved in other things. So uh, but I think it would that that's probably the next step for me to like, OK, so there's these suggestions. Now let's go implement them. And then what happens if that if then I'm rejected, that would be a big that would take more of a mental jump to convince myself that's okay you know so sure. but I think just telling yourself that this isn't that unusual is is helpful yep yeah. for me I can say rejection makes me stronger like makes me uh want to try harder okay I'm up for the challenge let's go that's that's me <laughs> I like that I like that yeah. find find a positive spin on it yes to, to yes. use it as a driving motivator I like that. yes I cannot quit no quitting <laughs> not going backward always forward I know another um, another technique that's very popular for some people is to keep a folder of things with you know some people might call it their feel-good folder where um, you know you keep copies of like, you know, an award you, a letter of about an award you <laughs> won good. or a letter from a student that says, you know, you're the most amazing teacher I've ever had or uh, a note from a colleague about how they, 
they read something you wrote that really helped them, you know, whatever it is, putting those little things in there that recognize your successes and having that on hand where when you get that rejection and you're kind of feeling down about it, you can take a moment to go remind yourself of those other successes and those other things that make you recognize your accomplishments and your skills. Um, that's another, I think, popular approach or, or at least a useful approach um, to helping to kind of break yourself out of that mindset and remember, you know, this is not about me. I've done lots, you know, I've done great things. I have these good things I can reflect on. Um, this is just a momentary, momentary setback. Um, and I, I really so like this quote um, from Carrie Ann Rockmore um, talking about this, this experience of rejection in academia, that while most of us can handle a certain amount of frustration, rejection, and disappointment, it's the cumulative effect of that negativity that can lead to exhaustion, paralysis, or depression. The problem occurs when we internalize the negativity and allow rejection to impact our sense of our own intellectual capacity, self-worth, and enjoyment of our work. Um, I just absolutely love that quote. So, you know, for me, it comes down to saying, yeah, I, I don't internalize this. Um, the rejection does not necessarily mean my paper was bad. Maybe it was just not the right fit for that journal. Um, if it's a rejection of one paper, that's not a rejection of all of my work and all of my ideas. Maybe I just need to work on how I'm communicating my ideas. And a rejection of my paper is not a rejection of me. It is not personalized. Um, we recognize that all researchers experience rejection at some point. Um, and I think it's, you know, I think it's important to realize that how commonly that is a part of academia, that I wish it wasn't, I wish there wasn't so much, so much rejection and negativity, but realizing the normalness of it can also help us to reflect on if I am too prone to internalize and suffer from those experiences of rejection, then maybe I want to think about an alternative career path. Maybe, yes. maybe I won't be able to sustain my mental health in academia. Um, and also, you know, sometimes thinking about how can we impact the system that we're in? How can we find ways to, um, to make that re experience of rejection less internalized across the system, less personal? Um, you know, for instance, when we ourselves act as reviewers for others, thinking about how we phrase the comments that we make and making sure that criticism is constructive and not hurtful, that kind of thing. So thinking about how we can how we can affect that from inside the system. Um, I did want to make one more note on this slide. So uh, Dr. Rockmore that I've quoted here is the founder of the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity, which is a resource for um, both faculty and graduate students, for people trying to navigate academia. Um, we do have subscriptions available to us through Sam Houston, and those are, um, all, all graduate students are eligible to create a free account um, under our university's subscription. And they have just like excellent webinars and courses talking about things like time management and dealing with stress, dealing with rejection, um, all of these types of topics. And they do have a special program that is targeted at graduate students um, for getting through, particularly getting through the doctoral school um, and dissertation process. So kind of a resource on our campus that I wanted to, to promote a little bit, Thank but you. it's a wonderful thing to get involved with. So final thoughts. Um, Kind of, I just really liked this page here. Wish for it, hope for it, dream of it, but by all means, do it. Um, it's not always an easy process and it, it can definitely be frustrating, but if it's something that you want to do, if you really want to become a published academic, then yes. you can do it. Um, and there's lots of people here on campus, including myself, that can help. Here's that slide of selected resources. Um, so this will be available to you after the session to be able to come back and access these links. I've included a few things that are particular to revising dissertations, responding to reviewers. Um, something I didn't really have time to address, but I've included a link here about dealing with coercive citation practices. Um, sometimes we may get feedback from an editor that says, oh, well, one of the revisions I want you to make is I want you to cite more articles from our journal or a reviewer may say, well, you need to cite, you know, my work by, by this reviewer or something like that. Um, so th those things should not happen. 
those are not appropriate. <laughs> um, I think in some disciplines there, there can become the sense that that's normal for the journal to want you to boost its citations in your work, but it's not ethical. So um, I did want to include at least one brief uh, reference to that here to think about if you receive those kinds of requests, how, how do you respond to that in, the, in that um, publication process? And that is all I had. So now I will ask what questions you have for me.